There being no further introductions, it's now time for members' statements. The member from Scarborough, Rouge River. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the first and the only member of Ontario Provincial Parliament with a Korean background, I rise today to highlight the disturbing situation in the Korean Peninsula. This year marks the 64th year since the end of the Korean War and the signing of the armistice to create demilitarized zone. Today, the area is far from demilitarization. Since October the 9, 2006, North Korea has conducted six nuclear tests, each test more powerful than its predecessor. The last test was equivalent to a magnitude 6.1 earthquake. To put it in perspective, North Korea's most recent nuclear test produced an explosion almost 17 times larger than the last plus from the bomb dropped over Hiroshima in 1945. Mr. Speaker, we know that tougher sanctions alone cannot bring peace to the Korean Peninsula. Korean Peninsula is one of the most densely populated areas in the world, with 76 million people at stake. Kulo has discipline, karma, more rational language, uh, what we need from all the parties involved. I urge all sides to do their utmost to defuse this situation as quickly as possible. Nothing else is acceptable. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, member from Oshawa. Canadian auto baron Colonel Sam McLaughlin and his wife Adelaide made Oshawa their home, inspired and built an automotive empire, and built a beautiful home, Parkwood. Today, the world can see Parkwood in many movies, from Billy Madison to X-Men, but in Oshawa, we see it as a special jewel in the heart of our downtown. Our community recently celebrated the 100th anniversary of this beautiful estate, fittingly on September 8th, R.S. McLaughlin's birthday. The centennial celebration of Parkwood was a wonderful evening in the loggia of the estate, surrounded by beautiful decor and history. Parkwood Estate and Gardens is the former home of Sam and Adelaide McLaughlin and is a mansion with 53 rooms. With all the original furnishings, china, and storied artifacts, Adelaide McLaughlin was involved and influential in the community, as was her philanthropist husband, Sam McLaughlin. McLaughlin established the McLaughlin Motor Car Company and later was the founder of General Motors Canada. His name can be seen across the community on the Cancer Centre, the McLaughlin Library, the RS McLaughlin Armory, the Robert McLaughlin Gallery, and elsewhere. One of my favourite places, Memorial Park, was made great because of his vision. I want to recognise the Parkwood Foundation and the awesome, long-standing Parkwood staff who lovingly maintain and manage the estate and award-winning gardens. Parkwood will bury a time capsule to be open 100 years from now. And while we won't be there, Speaker, I know that the people of 2117 Oshawa, Oshawa will still treasure Parkwood and enjoy it as we have for 100 years. Happy anniversary, Parkwood. I just want the member to know that I'll be here. The member from Mississauga Streetsville. Speaker, each September, the Mississauga Chinese Business Association hosts the men and women of our Peel Region Police and Fire Services at an annual fundraising dinner with the broader community. Our police officers and firefighters in Mississauga and Brampton live among us as our neighbours and friends. Our homes are side by side, our kids play together, we shop and worship in the same places. For more than 17 years, Mississauga has been Canada's safest city to live, work, study, do business and raise a family. The secret of Mississauga's success is that there is no secret. Our officers go to community events, know many of the people they serve by name, and return phone calls. They're part of the fabric of the community that they serve and protect. More new people move into Mississauga and Brampton each and every year than many North American police and fire services serve in total. In particular, our Peel Region Police Force serves a region with a greater population and a larger economy than the province of Manitoba. That's why our Mississauga families and neighbours celebrate the contributions, dedication and work ethic of the Peel Region Police Forces and our firefighters in Mississauga and Brampton. And our thanks to the Mississauga Chinese business community for its continuing commitment and leadership in sustaining that vital community support. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member, Sanders, the member from Niagara West Glamour. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today on behalf of the constituents of Niagara West Glanbrook to speak about inadequate planning and inefficient funding of long-term care facilities Shameful. in the Niagara region. The reality is that inadequate planning and inefficient funding are hurting long-term care across Niagara, but the Niagara region has been hit particularly hard because of our large and growing senior population. Nearly one in five Niagara residents are 65 years of age or older, and they deserve to know that they will be able to receive timely and prompt care if and when they need it. Absolutely. Right now, the provincial wait list for long-term care facilities stands at 27,000 individuals. Shameful. 4,858 individuals are on waiting lists in the Niagara region. On average, only 96 beds become available each month. month. And that means that even if no more people put themselves on our local wait list, it would take more than four years at the current levels uh, to have the lists cleared. Looking at the direction we're heading in, I may have to put my name on the list soon just to make sure I get in. Very sad. The problem is compounded by staff-to-resident ratios that are remarkably low, shamelessly low, in fact. I know the Minister of Health has been made aware of this con by concerned municipal representatives who have requested enhanced funding for long-term care facilities and an increase in the number of personal support workers. This government has wasted billions of dollars on a long litany of waste and scandal. Why won't it provide compassionate care for seniors who need and deserve it? They've contributed to the betterment of our communities for a lifetime, and now we have the duty to look after them. Thank you. Member Service, the member from Niagara Falls. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to talk about an important issue that women all throughout our province are facing, ovarian cancer. This year alone, 2,800 women will be diagnosed with ovarian cancer. 1,700 will actually die from the disease. This is the highest mortality rate of women's cancer. I have three daughters, four granddaughters, and my wife, Rita. So this is an important health issue. It's very close to my heart. Mr. Speaker, the women who are facing such a daunting outcome of having ovarian cancer are brave and witness the bravery of many women in my riding. Last week, I had the privilege of attending the, the Cancer Walk of Hope in my riding of Niagara Falls. Last year, the walk raised $20,000. I'd like to thank the volunteers. I'd also like to thank Ovarian Cancer Canada. They have created a wonderful campaign called Got Lady Balls. The campaign is meant to bring attention to the fact that women have balls too, and they're called ovaries. This campaign has been the most successful in raising awareness and donations. At that walk, I happened to meet and speak with a stage four cancer survivor. Her story was inspiring, but also telling. Diseases like breast cancer, prostate cancer have seen great advances in outcomes and treatment, which is largely due to the amount of investment in research. However, outcomes for ovarian cancer has not changed for the last 50 years. This is simply unacceptable. Five Canadian women die each day. There have actually been no changes in treatment that is offered to women of cancer since 1990. This government has taken a look at this cancer and, and why they have limited success in the outcomes of women that are diagnosed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Member Savis, the member from Ottawa, Vanier. Mr. President, je me lève Mr. Speaker, I wish to raise to talk about Ottawa River. Ottawa region, and it is at the heart of Algonquin territory. Indeed, Ottawa is a city that has the meeting place of three rivers, the Gatineau River, the Rideau River, and the Ottawa River. And now the Ottawa River is a designated heritage river. La désignation vise à souligner le We wish to express the historic and cultural of this river, and we can better protect this river of the Ottawa River keepers required the cooperation of the federal government, the Ontario and the Quebec government. Last month, I had the privilege of representing the Minister of Natural Resources at the official designation ceremony on the river, on a boat on the river. Elder Claudette Comanda, a great friend of mine, opened the ceremony by reminding us of the importance of water for our survival and the importance of the river to the Algonquin. La ministre fédérale était là. The federal minister was there, as well as a minister from Quebec, to uh, this ceremony reminded us that uh, the role of the river for the Algonquins, and the Algonquins call it the uh, Kisipisi, and the links between Quebec and Ontario 
uh, I just want to thank the volunteers who organized this great ceremony. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have two young professional gentlemen here, Michael Warshawski and Justin Rotman, who both graduated from Queens. And as they explained to me, uh, Michael spoke to Justin and said, uh, "You know what? I'm." want to do some research and do a little project, and Justin was game, to basically focus on financial literacy for young adults, because uh, Michael recognized that maybe he hadn't gotten the best education um, up to that point, and he wanted to really have a true understanding and be able to invest properly for, properly for his future, and not in 10 or 20 years look back and say, I should have done it this way versus that way. Well, what's come out of this project is the surprisingly simple personal finance pocketbook, and it's on sale starting very soon in all kinds of bookstores on campuses, and I hope it's going to be in regular bookstores as well. I'm looking forward to the big launch. And um, I just want to remind everybody that it's an important discussion to have with your families, with your children. I think it's one of those subjects that people find hard sometimes to talk about, saving for the future and understanding, as Michael said, the difference between a tax-free savings account and an RRSP. So I'm looking forward to lots of continued success from Michael and Justin, and thank you for coming down today and joining us and sitting down and explaining to me about the book. Um, and uh, vis I want to invite everybody to visit surprisinglysimple.ca and they created a special page just for us, slash MPP. So surprisinglysimple.ca slash MPP for all the MPPs in the room. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member statements, the member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. It gives me great pleasure to rise today in celebration and to acknowledge the Diamond Jubilee of His Highness, the Aga Khan, that was celebrated this past summer on July 11th. The Aga Khan is the spiritual leader of 15 million people around the world, including over 120,000 here in Canada who belong to the Ishmaeli faith. And over the past six decades, His, His Highness the Aga Khan has helped transform the quality of life for millions of people around the world, regardless of their religion. And here in Canada, the Diamond Jubilee is an opportunity to celebrate His Highness and the Ishmaeli community's embrace of Canadian values. It allows us to recognize the significant investment of the Aga Khan Foundation in Canada and in the province of Ontario, including the Aga Khan Museum and the Aga Khan Park, which is here in Toronto. And, Speaker, if you haven't been to the Aga Khan Museum to see the wonderful treasures there, I highly urge you to do so. The Canadian Ismaili community is also celebrating 150 years of Confederation of Canada and have launched Ismaili Civic 150, a pledge of a million hours of voluntary service in Canada. Beaches East York is home to a large community of Ishmaeli Canadians who devote countless hours to serving our community, and I'm proud to call many of them friends. Ishmaeli Civic Day will be held on September 17th, when the Ishmaeli Muslim community in Canada will join hands in providing service to this great nation to improve the quality of life of all Canadians. And I'd like to encourage everyone to participate. So please join me in thanking some of the many volunteers who are here today, who through the spiritual leadership of His Highness the Aga Khan, truly make our province a better place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Further members, same as the member for Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. As part of the 2017 Sustainable Schools Report, the Toronto and Regional Conservation Authorities recently announced the highest performing school boards across the province in terms of energy efficiency. And I'm pleased to say that the most energy efficient school board in Ontario for 2017 is the Durham District School Board. Roughly 50% of the schools in the board are now outfitted with real-time energy monitoring speaker, which allows consumption to be monitored so that schools can attempt to find efficiencies. Other initiatives include upgrades to lighting, mechanical systems, and boiler plants, but also training custodians in the most energy efficient practices and, of course, getting students involved in energy conservation. There are more than 70 schools certified through the ECHO Schools program under the Durham District School Board, and this program focuses on energy conservation, waste reduction, and teaching ecological literacy. Speaker, I want to congratulate the Durham District School Board, the schools, and of course the education of workers and students for this significant achievement. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. I thank all members uh, for their statements. It's therefore now time for reports by committees.